My name's Karen Wagg and I work in the Paper and Textiles Conservation Lab here at the National Museum of Australia. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land of which we meet. So today's program is being run in conjunction with the museum workshop exhibition that's currently on here at the museum, um, where you can uh, get an insight into the role that conservators play in caring for the collection and getting objects ready for display. So I urge you to all visit the exhibition that's on in our temporary exhibition gallery and um, visit our website too because we have a lot of material there um, to back up the exhibition. So during today's session, we'll be looking at some of the principles that will help you to care for your own precious paper and textiles items, such as photo albums and wedding dresses. Um, I will start by looking at some issues surrounding the preservation of photographs and demonstrate some good ways of putting photos into albums um, before handing over to senior textiles and paper conservator Camilla Mollica, um, who will look at and discuss and demonstrate some ways to care for your delicate textile items, such as wedding dresses. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone here today, and I'd also like to extend a welcome to Kayama, who are crossing to us um, via live link. So now um, I'd like to hand over to Michelle Hudson, um, from the Manager of Library Services at Kayama, who's um, going to say a few words. Thank you, Karen. Um, here at Kayama, I'd like to say good afternoon to the audience down in Canberra and a thank you to the National Museum of Australia for, for providing us with the opportunity to participate in the class and we look forward to sharing your experience with our local community. Look forward to um, participating in the question and the answer session later on. Thank you. So now I'd like to ask everyone to turn off your mobile phones or turn them to silent and can Kayama please um, turn your microphone to mute until question time. So there will be time for questions at the end of the session, so I'd like you to all save your questions until that time. Um, we'll cross to Kriyama for their questions first and then we'll go to questions from our Visions audience. Um, so I do want to remind people that if you do ask a question during the Q&A session, um, the, you will be being recorded for museum-related websites, so by asking the question you're giving your consent to be recorded. So. The deterioration and damage that we see in paper and textiles objects occurs because of inherent and external factors. So the inherent factors relate to the physical makeup of objects which cause them to deteriorate and these problems can be hard to deal with. The external factors that contribute to deterioration and damage are easier to um, control. So I'd look, like to talk about um, the issues as they relate to photographs and Camilla will discuss how they relate to garments. However, many of the principles for caring for photos um, and garments or uh, paper and textiles are similar in that they are preventative measures relating to maintaining stable, um, suitable environmental conditions for objects, implementing good handling practices and having the correct types of physical storage for items. So when we talk about suitable environmental conditions, um, we really mean things like dark storage areas because visible and UV light um, uh, can damage objects by fading and making them brittle. Um, you want to have a stable relative humidity, so um, one that's not too high or too low, but um, when we say stable, that's because paper and textiles are organic, so they swell and contract um, with changes in relative humidity, uh, so you don't want fluctuations in a short period of time. Stable temperatures um, are also important, um, so temperatures that are comfortable for humans, you know, are also good for your objects. Um, uh, when you have pest and mould outbreaks um, in your paper and textiles items, it's often related to poor environmental conditions, so it's good to look for the causes of these outbreaks. Um, by maintaining good housekeeping um, and monitoring your objects, um, you will, will keep these things at a minimum. So that just means that you, know, you want to keep your storage areas clean and you want to regularly check for um, insect and mould outbreaks. Okay, so in your home, really the, the centre of your home is probably best. Um, it's the most stable, stable environment, so you want to avoid putting things in your, in your ceiling cavities and under your house and avoid putting things against external walls as well. So um, good handling practices are also very important. So this just means it's important to plan what you're doing before you start. So you want to have enough space to work, you want to have the, the time you need and the materials you need all at hand before you, before you get started. Um, 
it's important to have clean hands, or you can wear gloves. Um, you can uh, wear plastic gloves, and it, if you are wearing plastic gloves, you can look for close-fitting gloves that are a good quality. You want them to be powder-free. Um, surgical, surgical gloves are good. Um, you can wear cotton gloves as well, but um, just, just be aware that you lose a bit of sensitivity of touch with cotton gloves, and the threads can get, become caught on things. Remove your jewellery as well before you start. When you're moving objects, it is also important to make sure that they're supported well. So um, when you're storing objects, you want to have the, the physical storage um, materials that you use to be um, ones that are not going to react adversely with the objects. So that just means you want to look for things like archival and acid-free um, storage materials for your objects. And we'll look a bit more specifically at some examples um, here today. So I'm going to look at some, some examples for photographs. So when we talk about photographs, um, true photographs means writing with light. So they're, um, they've been processed using light um, and they have a different chemical makeup and structure to digital prints, which are often done on laser or bubble, bubble jet printers. So some of the um, aspects of care are the same as for all paper objects. But, um, but you do have the delicate emulsion layers and things like that with a, with a true photograph that you, you need to be very um, aware of when you're handling and storing them. So here we have, um, if you, when you're putting together new albums, you want to avoid sticking your photographs down um, onto pages. Um, things like scrapbooking are great, and, and by all means, do that, but use copies. So, so you've always got your, your archival um, or original separate. Um, this, is a, this is one option you can use. So plastic sleeves are great for photographs. Um, what you want to look for is a plastic that's a polyester, often sold as, as mylar, um, or, a, or a polypropylene plastic sleeve. Um, and you can buy these from, from conservation suppliers. We'll tell you some at the end of the session. Um, and, and they're great because you can add them, uh, add them to albums in these ring binding um, folios. Um, without actually handling the photographs themselves. This is a great one that we have here because it's also got um, a protective box, which is another good thing to have with albums. And that snaps into there for storage. Um, you, another great way to put your photos into albums is to use photo corners, and you can buy photo corners. Um, but you can also make your own. So you can use mylar plastic um, and fold it. So here I've got a a straight piece of mylar plastic, but you can also use paper. So by folding it into a little triangle, you can put your double-sided sticky tape on the, on the back, stick that down to your, your pages, and what you want to um, use for your pages is a, a good acid-free, medium to heavyweight card, and you can stick those down and put your photos in that way. If you have photos facing each other in an album, you can interleaf with things like an archival text paper. It's often better to use a slightly heavier paper than a tissue because the tissue can become crumpled up and cause physical damage to your photos. But you can also buy albums, paper albums, that you can put photos into using, using photo corners. But again, you just want to look for um, product labels that say that they're archival and things like that. Now, with photographs, um, you can also look for products that say that they've been pat tested, and that's a photoactivity test that's an international standard for products um, that have all been tested for their reactivity with photographs um, done by the Image Permanence Institute. If you don't want to put your photos into albums, you can, use, um, you can put them into boxes. It's good to sort them into like-sized photographs. And the best way to do it is to actually um, make an enclosure for indi individual photographs. So you can purchase these three flap or four flap folders, which have a, another flap at the top here, or you can make them yourself. And that's um, just a great way of encapsulating your photograph not having to handle it physically. You can also put your labels then on the paper enclosure and you don't have to label the photo. So you want to avoid labeling photos, particularly with, with biros and inks. Um, if you do feel that you want to put a label on your photograph, put it on the back 
along, a, along a side and use a soft pencil like a graphite B pencil. I've, I have an album here to show you when, you, when you're handling your albums, uh, it is important to, to be aware of their structure, so to support them. Um, when you're transporting albums and even individual photos, you can use a piece of heavy card to move things to where you're working or a tray. And um, when we open out an album, it's good to have something to support it on. So this is a, this is a book pillow. Um, you can use pillows at home. Two pillows that you've just stitched together in the centre makes a good, a good shaped um, support for an album. Now this is an album that has good um, features and bad features. So it's black paper. You want to avoid coloured papers, um, particularly black paper, um, because it can have sulphur in it, which can um, react adversely with some of your, some of your photographs. So other things you want to avoid are putting stacks of photographs together with paper clips, um, using PVC plastic enclosures, and, and you can often smell something that's got PVC in it. Um, when you're interleaving, you want to remember that you're putting extra strain, if, it, if it's a bound album, you're putting extra strain on, on the structure. Uh, so you don't, you don't want to put too much extra bulk into the structure of a, of a bound book. So we'll have some more questions at the end. Um, but when you do see deterioration with your photographs as well, it's, it's good to sort of contact a conservator and you can go to the AICCM, which is the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials um, website, and that's where you can find um, conservators in your local area. So now I'll hand over to Carmela. Thanks, Karen. Well, like Karen said, paper and textile sort of, you know, work, react quite closely. You know, to the same you know, environments and problems that way. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of what Karen has said, but concentrate on three main ways of, um, I suppose, reducing some of that deterioration on garments. And in the, today I've got a wedding dress here, just to use that as an example. So there's three main, we either store them flat, or we can store them on a hanger, or we can roll. So we'll start with uh, storing in a box or it could be even in a drawer um, and the creasing is one of the major um, causes of damage to a textile especially if it's a silk it's quite fragile um, so before we put anything away we want to try and put it away clean because over time we do find that um, you, you may not see the stain or you've spilt a, gl a glass of champagne on your wedding dress or someone else has um, and that over time that stain will oxidise with the impurities in there. So we do want to clean it before we put it away. Then once we've um, done all that, the best way to, um, I suppose, reduce the creasing is to actually make special supports that fit inside the, um, the dress really well. And here uh, we can use acid-free tissue, and Karen mentioned about acidity in items. So you can use tissue. In this case, we've done a combination of um, Dacron wadding, special supports that we make ourselves, and tissue. So if you don't want to go to the effort of making those special supports, you can use your tissue. And if you, um, because what we're trying to do is um, make that fabric run over a, um, not create that crease, but have a smooth um, surface. We just crunch up our tissue, but we don't want that rough surface against our fabric, because again, over time, that can um, mould, or the fabric can mould into that uh, crease and cause damage over time. So we do want it to go over a smooth um, surface, so we just, get another piece of tissue and roll it over. So I just drew it on the surface. Roll that and you end up with a smoother area that you can then put inside your sleeve or your seams or your bodice. But the ones that we've got here at the moment, what we've done is actually created a, a shape of the sleeve or the bodice using Dacron wadding. And this you'll find in your, um, if any of you use, use uh, 
sewers. You're probably familiar with it, or quilters. It's used in quilting. It's 100% polyester wadding. And we just then roll and create a shape, whether it's something like that, or a nice long, what we call a Dacron sausage, <laughs> um, and different lengths as well, um, and different shapes. So you've just got your wadding inside, roll to whatever shape and size you want. Then the outer layer, again we're looking at a smooth fabric. In this case it's 100% polyester as well, it's like a lining fabric. But when we do use any of these outer fabrics to um, provide the support, we do need to pre-wash them. Because in the manufacturing process you've got starches and even getting it from the manufacturer to your home, there's other impurities that um, can build up in the fabric. So we want to have clean fabric against our precious item. So they do get pre-washed and just a hot wash. We don't add any detergents or anything to it. So just a, a, a nice quick hot wash will be perfect. Once we've done that, we've created a, like a long sausage and we feed that Dacron into that roll. I then just provide, just have a gathering thread around the, the end and if I can find my ends, just pulling them together and just get gathering it neatly and tying it off so you end up with a nice finish like that. And again, we don't use anything that's, that can catch onto the item that we're supporting. And your body. Now, if um, for you know, if this this particular dress doesn't have a veil, but if it did, uh, we again we could concertina that in the box itself. Again, using the rolls and concertining or it, reducing the size of the veil, or we can roll that veil using an archival roll. Again, we've covered this in acid-free tissue, but you could cover that in your fabric as well. Once you've prepared it, you need to make sure that you've got you know, enough space at either end so that you handle the roll rather than the textile itself. And when you're rolling, we try and roll straight. We don't want to um, start getting a sort of a ladder effect happening um, because, again, that fabric over another area can cause splitting of that, um, that textile. So rolling and interleaving, that's a very important thing also to remember when we are folding or rolling to interleave, uh, whether it's with acid-free tissue or um, a fabric. And just in terms of fabric, we also use uh, Japara or Calico or stretch knit, but again, just remembering to pre-wash it. And we, the reason why we interleave is we don't want transference of dyes. Uh, sometimes a garment will have um, hooks and eyes or press studs or metal embroidery. So we, we're trying to reduce uh, any corrosion that may occur that we're not aware of um, and transfer onto the other part of the garment. So you can see with the, the actual train in this dress here, we have provided tissue along the folds, but also we've interleaved it, the different layers with the the tissue under there. If you, um, you know, don't have the space for boxing, the other thing that we can look at is hanging. And with that, we do prepare coat hangers in a special way so that we are supporting the garment along the shoulders. Because when, when you're looking at wedding gowns, they're quite heavy, so we want to provide as much support along the shoulders. Sometimes we have to actually attach tapes on the, uh, around the waist, because that's one of our strongest areas, just to reduce that weight of the rest of the train. And those tapes will just hang over the coat hanger that, um, that you use. That's only a, a small size hanger, which is probably not quite the right size for a, a wedding gown, but you can make them as large as something as, as thick as that. 
So again, we look at the garment and pad it, not over pad because you don't want to start splitting and causing further damage, but just enough to support the garment. And again, to protect it from the external environments, whether it's in your wardrobe or um, travelling if you need to take it elsewhere, providing a cover for it. Um, again, we've used par silk or silk lining, polyester, but you can use your calico, um, your japara, anything that's, again, pre-washed um, and that will protect. And you can see the length that you may need to go to for your wedding gown. Ties. Again, we don't want to uh, um, use any metals or zip metallic zippers or press studs or hooks and eyes because that's another material that we're trying to avoid as... Um, against fabrics. Um, so ag again, just with your handling of your items, you know, don't pick up from the shoulders, support the, the bulk of the fabric. Um, and things also, things to, uh, I suppose, avoid, you know, if I bring out, you know, there's a couple of wedding dresses in there and they're quite heavy and it's the bulk of it's on the bottom. We're trying to avoid creasing, that's not quite the right thing. But also the, the coat hangers aren't providing the, the correct support. They're also a plastic that can de degrade over time. But if we do use a uh, plastic coat hanger, we just need to make sure it's a polypropylene or polyethylene rather than a, um, a PVC where there's chlorides that can um, damage the materials over time. This particular cover, cover is a polyester, so it's fine, uh, but obviously the length of it, it's not suitable for, for that garment. Um, you can, there's... You know, commercial cushion pillows that you can use as well to, if you don't want to go to the effort of making all these dunas that work um, just as well, cutting them smaller, fit into the garment. And in this dress here, we have lined the box, and it's really just to provide another protection. Um, and also, if we did need to lift that um, item out of the box, we've got something that we can use to support, and two people obviously would need to lift that out and put it onto a table, and someone will replace it, put it back into there. So again, um, if you, you know, need to have something clean, that you, um, it's best to possibly, you know, contact a conservator and visit the ARCC website and get some ideas there or um, our website. Um, and a, a good other little tip, uh, with, you know, Karen talked about labelling. A, a label and a photo outside of your box or even, you know, on the outside of your... Um, hanging uh, bag is always a good thing so that you're not having to rummage through your box and to, to remember, well, what did I put in there? You've got a nice image in, um, on the outside of, of that um, box. So I think I'll leave it at that and I'm sure there'll be questions. <laughs> so um, now we'll have our, our questions session. So we'll be crossing to Kayama first for their questions, but I do want to remind people that we we can't answer specific questions about any of your, your own objects if you have them here today, um, but, but we would like to take some general questions. So if Kayama can unmute their microphones, and if you um, are asking a question, make sure that you speak into the microphone. I have a question. I just wondered, with the garments, if they can't be washed, can they be dry cleaned? Or is that... Because a lot of garments that can't be washed, especially with embroidery and things on them. Thank that's, you. That's right. Um, <laughs> normally, a lot of the um, garments do have a garment label that will give you an idea of what, you know, if it can be hand washed or dry cleaned only. Um, you can dry clean. Obviously, uh, you, are, you know, we can't recommend anyone <laughs> a, a dry cleaner in Kayama or um, here in Canberra either, but just going, visiting your dry cleaner and just getting, you know, asking them questions about what their processes are and how do they uh, deal with 
uh, items that have got lots of embroidery, um, uh, metallic thread or any surface decoration and, and how they uh, deal with that. And that's, that'll give you an idea whether you can trust them with your, <laughs> with your objects. But certainly uh, we do dry clean. Um, you know, here at the museum, if we can manage the size, we do it ourselves with, um, you know, under extraction hoods and so on. But you can take things out uh, commercially and have them dry cleaned. I notice that all the photographs are loose. I have some photographs that have been stuck to black um, albums and then dispersed amongst relatives as um, people have passed away. What do you do with those photographs? So sorry, the photographs are actually physically stuck down to the black pages or? Yes, physically stuck down. So you don't want to try and remove um, photos that have been stuck down yourself. Um, I would say that in that situation, it is best to take them to a conservator just so that they can actually look at what condition they're in, whether that's um, causing um, damage to them, um, and they can um, give, you, give you some advice on, on what you can do about that. I think that might be all the questions we have here at Kayama. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kayama. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll take questions um, from the room. Someone will be coming around with a microphone, so please wait until you have the microphone before you ask a question. My question's about um, old fabrics that sometimes develop little brown marks mm -hmm. indiscriminately across them. Is there anything that can be done about that, those brown marks? It, uh, brown marks could be um, what we call a foxing or it could be just cellulose degradation over time. Where it, how has it been stored? Is it from the materials that it's been uh, in against? And sometimes that, um, you know, you can reduce that. Sometimes you can't. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you come and look at this garment closely, you'll see that there are still stains there. It has been treated. But what our aim is to actually reduce what the components of that stain are um, not necessarily try and remove the actual um, colour because um, sometimes you, you can't reduce that and without knowing what the item is or how that stain has come about, it's difficult to provide any, you know, one answer to it. Uh, but it may have occurred from, you know, the materials that were stored in, you know, whether it's in a drawer, the... Um, you know, timbers also emit um, vapours that can cause damage to or staining on a garment. Was it from having been worn in, in the past? So, yeah, I suppose if you're concerned about something, maybe, you know, again, visit our, the ARCC website and someone can give you some separate, you know, detailed advice there. Thank you. Okay. Have a question? Or? No, yeah, Alex. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, love. Um, I've got a question about conserving letters. Um, would you go through the same process as photographs to restore old letters? Um, well, paper objects. Um, there are some general principles about um, caring for your paper objects. Um, with letters and things like that, a lot of the time, some of the damage that you see is from the physical handling, particularly things like folding those letters. Mm -hmm. So it's often a good idea to store um, those letters flat if you can. And plastic sleeves are a really good, um, a good option for, for letters um, because you don't have to handle the paper itself. You can have them, you can still read them and things like that. Um, the storage conditions are, are very similar. Again, it's, it's your environmental conditions um, and, and just, you know, having clean hands when you do handle them and things mm. like that. So, mm. yes. And I suppose if, if it is fault, sorry to interrupt, um, not forcing the letter mm. open because um, that's where you can cause f you yes. know, splitting of yeah. that letter. If it's already folded, yeah. but don't fold them up to store but them. No. Mm. no. So, just take um, my question is relating to um, 
vintage and antique um, clothing. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, um, firstly, you mentioned that the museum um, has dry cleaners, um, who you use or whether that's someone internally. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I, ha I have quite a few garments um, from 20s through to Victorian era and as you're aware, they um, didn't have deodorants and quite a few of them have perspiration um, marks varying from faint to quite dark and, and what would be your advice in relation to conserving garments with that sort of thing and also with um, the metal weights in the bottom of the gowns, mm -hmm. um, whether you would advise removing them? With, I think m metals obviously react to your environments that we were um, mentioning earlier. So the, we need to look at the whole picture, I suppose, and where they are stored and the environment. And we don't, I mean, here at the museum, we don't remove metal weights unless they're causing, you know, they've already caused a considerable amount of damage or they've rusted and then we will consider something like that. But if they, you know, there's no signs of, of anything having happened, then looking at the environment in which we, we store them in and having that consistent temperature and relative humidity so that that metal doesn't pull, um, start to corrode and, and so on. With um, dry cleaners, I mean, we dry clean items ourselves here if we're able to. If not, we do go externally and again it was similar to what I was saying earlier we um, I mean we're familiar with some of the dry cleaners and, and we do quiz them and you know a simple thing as we'd like our items dry cleaned first thing in the morning for example so that you know they've gone through the solution fresh a fresh solution rather at the end of the day when you know a whole lot of other items are um, can already been dry clean. But we do a lot of testing before we send them out to dry cleaners ourselves um, to make sure that they um, will cope with the, the solvents and that they use. Thank you. Um, I've got a large uh, number of um, old fabrics. Mm -hmm. And with some of them, I can tell what type of fabric it is. But with others, it's very difficult um, to do that, to establish. Mm -hmm. Do you have any pointers or any, any? Uh, any pointers or any ways that possibly, um, you know, we could, I could establish the components of the fabric? So you're talking about what fibre yes, composition right. they are? Yes. Well, I mean, we look at the, the best way to identify fibre, I suppose, is looking at it under a microscope. Um, and that's what we use here at the museum, um, just taking very sm small fibre, because um, a lot of these uh, and, uh, and, uh, analytical techniques are destructive, so obviously we, we don't want any of go down the, those, um, that path. So just um, a very, very small fibre sample um, is enough for us to determine what fibre it is under the microscope. So that's... Um, you know, there's other, if you've worked with fabrics, you know, just feel um, and handle and again, you know, make sure your hands are clean um, when you do that and, and so on. But yeah, microscope's a good friend of ours. <laughs> um, I've got a double barreled question, if I may. The first part of it is uh, off-the-shelf photo albums. Can you give us a comment about uh, their efficacy and whether they should be used or not used? And in relation to that, should we be treating photos that are a century old or older differently to the manner in which we treat more recent uh, photos in relation to the paper and whatnot that's used for them? Certainly. Well, you can get some good quality photo albums um, that you can purchase. So um, again, um, you know, you want to look for either the, the sleeves or the, the paper that's a, a good quality archival acid-free paper and again, you know, avoiding coloured papers. Um, I think we'll, there's, a, there's a few um, suppliers that you can go to, so... Yeah. Um, the, uh, there's archival suppliers um, in Australia that the uh, general public can also purchase art albums or anything from. So I can list them out or if you want to come and see us at the end of the session, happy to give them to you. But um, you can, like Karen said, some of those 
commercial or yeah some of them are, some of them are fine. fine so just look for things like you know that they are I mean if you're going for the sleeves that it is a polyester or a mm. polypropylene um, that your papers are acid free or they often will say archival quality even you know scrapbooking suppliers often will say that they've passed the pat photoactivity test mm. so so you know a lot of products will will have information on them um, and with your older photographs, certainly, you know, they, they are delicate photos um, uh, are um, unstable in their nature. Um, so, so you do have deterioration. And I, I mentioned very briefly inherent factors and, mm. and certainly true photographs. There are a lot of in inherent factors that, that are going to cause them to deteriorate over time and chemicals within their structure. So you do need to be quite careful about the materials that you put in contact with, with true photographs because um, they do interact. And that's, as I mentioned, black pages will often contain uh, sulphur, which interacts adversely with the silver, which is, which is used in most of the older photographs and mm. things like that. Um, so, yeah. so you do need to be extra careful with your older photographs. There's oft, often also a lot of damage that you do see already. So um, if it's something that's inherent in it, that it's deteriorating, it's good to take even a digital snap if you don't have negatives of the way it looks now so that you can at least record it um, before it deteriorates further. Mm. Thank you. Well, you've almost answered my question, but it was how do I identify what this plastic is, if it's polyethylene PVC or whatever? If it's not, if, if I receive, perhaps if I receive something, they say it's no longer got the shops, its credentials on it. Well, PVC you can often smell, so that's a good a good yeah. tip. So it's got a very very strong smell. Um, it's, it's like a chlorine because it's the polyvinyl chloride. Um, you can, uh, if there's, there is a, a simple test where you apply a hot needle to that plastic. And, and then sort of a flame. And if you get a green flame, <laughs> <laughs> um, that gives off, that indicates that there's chlorides present. But if, yeah. you've, if, you've, if you're looking for products, I mean, yeah. you go for the ones where it tells you what, what it is on, on the product. And yeah. a lot of commercial ones that will tell you what yeah. the plastic present is on the, on the packaging. Um, or at least you can, you know, you can find ones that do tell you that. And that way you're sure because you know, if, if you have products that say nothing about what's in them, then you have no sure. true way of knowing. Yeah. And it's also sometimes the feel of, mm -hmm. you know, the PVC is quite crisp and crunchy and as if it's almost going <laughs> to snap and break, mm. whereas a, a poly, you know, polypropylene or polyethylene, it's a, a softer um, material. Also, your food containers, um, containers that you can store food um, in them, not your two-dollar ones, but you know your Tupperwares and things like that. That's a stable um, material that you can use to mm. store um, your albums and things. Um, just in relation to that, the storage and plastic. Um, you can get those big um, plastic boxes. I see that there's a plastic tray with a lid underneath the, mm -hmm. the box there. Um, not necessarily referring to that, but um, you can get big storage boxes that, I don't know whether you know what I'm talking about, but mm. you, there are a lot of them around, and um, big enough to take volumes of um, photo albums. Mm. Are they suitable for storing things such as this in? Are they made from the appropriate plastic? No, most of them are polypropylene. Mm. Uh, so they are suitable. What um, we, just like I've done here with the garment, mm. and I've lined it. Um, you know, if, if you just to give you that extra protection, I suppose lining that uh, box with um, a, sh a, a sheet of clean calico, or you know, a, a white cotton sheet that's obviously clean and been pre pre washed, and and line that. So that provides another barrier. Uh, but certainly they're suitable and you can seal them and, you know, prevent it insects. You that extra, and yeah, it gives you that extra protection. Yeah. So it is quite good to sort of put your albums into, into boxes yeah. and storage containers. Um, we've got some embroidered baby garments from the mid-1800s mm. uh, which have been stored rolled in tissue paper. Okay. But they're yellowing. 
Uh, is there anything I could do to reverse that or to prevent it um, becoming worse? Do you have any suggestions about <laughs> well, baby clothes that are quite <laughs> old? Yeah. They're cotton, yeah. um, you know, a, a white cotton, quite sturdy fabric. Right. But with a lot of very fine embroidery. Right, OK. So very similar to what we've been talking about and rolling a garment is, you know, a three-dimensional garment and having that rolled, you're creating creases and over time damage there, so it's best not to have it rolled, but just laying it flat um, in a box or um, something like that. In terms of the yellowing, again, it's really, um, um, you know, depending on what's caused that yellowing, yeah. um, sometimes it's just general, what we call cellulose degradation, which is mm -hmm. just the inherent nature of the cotton, and it just discolours um, over time, and that can be reduced, um, but you've got embroidery on there. There's other, you know, issues that you may need to consider. So it's really hard to give you, a, you know, a one answer on that one. Mm. So it might again be best to, you know, visit the AICC website and uh, consult with a conservator and, yeah. and give you so the the advice on that. The long christening robe we have hung rather like you mm -hmm. described for the wedding dress, and that has done better mm -hmm. than the short baby garments that have been rolled up in tissue paper. Tissue. Mm. Yeah. Fabrics are, you know, fabric with fabric. It's mm. um, one of the better, I suppose, materials to use in terms yeah. of long-term preservation. I just wondered if, you know, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to try and reverse the yellowing. Um, well, you, you, you can and you can't. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we, you know... A, a, a wet clean um, is is suitable for for that, right? Um, but I I just I can't recommend. No, you'd have that to process see it. Yes. I haven't seen it. Thank you. So, yeah. so far, we've been talking about textiles that are mainly woven, are there any special issues around knitted garments and moth repellents in particular? Um, knitted garments would be treated in the same way, so you'd pad them out and so use the same materials, obviously make sure that they, you know, if you can clean them before you do put them away, especially woolen garments where you take them away over the winter break, uh, over the summer, sorry and bring them out in winter, um, you need to make sure that they are clean. And it's mainly for um, insects because they do like to eat on, you know, foods that are um, present on, in the garment and stains. Um, <coughs> uh, what was the other question? The repellents, yes. moth repellents. Um, I, think our, I think Karen mentioned earlier the best thing to avoid or try and reduce the insects entering your home or in a particular area is good housekeeping. So just making sure that areas are, are, are clean, um, not having, you know, little corners that um, insects can crawl into and, you know, because that'll be nice and yummy for them there. So we, I mean, the museum has to deal with insects just like you know, I do at home, and we do. We we check. We go around in the in the buildings, make sure that there there aren't any issues with insects. Um, you use sticky traps. Sticky traps. Um, you can you know use in perimeter sprays, and again you know some people don't like to fumigate their places, but a lot of the pyrethrin sprays that are used are natural, um, and obviously aren't harmful to. To individuals so there's different approaches we don't put anything specific in a yeah. box with a garment and we certainly you know naphthalene was one that was used mm. over the years and certainly not a good thing to to be using um, with your garments and they also naphthalene is no good for us as humans so we try and avoid anything um, 
with that. We have some, some linen. It's around about 100 years or more old. And I, I was looking at it the other day and noticed that there are some little cracks and uh, places where the threads have worn through. Mm -hmm. And obviously, historically, over the years, they, they, some of these have been mended. And I wonder if these new ones that I've discovered, um, if, should I try to mend them? And if so, how should I do it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should I use a sewing machine or should I do it by hand with silk thread or should I just leave it alone? Probably just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. um, is, are they linen pieces that you're using? or that, Well, I mean, one of them is a big damask tablecloth, mm -hmm. which we've, we've always used on Christmas Day. And... Um, Another one is a, there's a beautiful hand-embroidered bedspread, which very, very occasionally we give ourselves a treat and decorate our bed with it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I would absolutely hate to make things worse mm -hmm. um, by leaving an unmended mm. uh, tear or hole. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose we don't use a sewing machine to mend um, tears. No. Um, it's usually hand hand stitching, but again, that's going to come down to Your skills. you and yeah. the use and um, the significance of the item and yeah. Uh, yeah. things like that. But if, if I, I mean, in some of the ones that have already been mended in the past, um, and not very well, I may say, <laughs> um, what, what thread would I use? Well, we normally try and um, keep the same, so if it's a cotton yeah. uh, or if it's a linen, we try and use the same thread yeah. um, as what the item's made of, mm -hmm. uh, if that thread's going to be suitable for that repair. Sometimes we do need to go down a, and use a polyester thread for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, we make that call um, depending on, on what we're repairing. Yeah. If it's a silk item, we try and use silk. Uh, for that repair, and it, and also again depends on where and what the item is. Um, one other As question: we we have a a fan dating from the 1890s. Uh, it's um, silk um, with ivory sticks, mm -hmm. and um, they, some of the sticks have become detached. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a lot of cracking of the silk, and I realise that's past help. But um, should I just leave it alone and not, not play with it or, and say, well, that's sad, but it's broken? Or is there anything I can do to prevent, well, say, further deterioration? Um, Nothing's it, beyond help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it, has it, the guards on them been stuck down or they stitched what the, the adhesive has... I mean, I can't provide any uh, yeah, any answers here. It, yeah, yeah. Um, and it might be again someone that a conservator would need to have a look at. Yes. But hand, you know, the less handling of that item would be beneficial for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I suppose providing, you know, whether it's a, a tray or um, a small box for it, but you can still handle and view the item, but you're not actually um, going to be able to manoeuvre, you know, holding it and is it closed or open, um, that's, you know, the other thing. Yeah, um, it's closed and it's wrapped in tissue. Yeah. I always had the idea that I'd like to have it framed, but that's yeah. probably not a good idea. Um, no, you can frame fans and, I mean, they do require a special support and mm. um, obviously because, you, you know, when you open up a fan, it's not a straight. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, so it it's won't sit flat on, the, on a... Um, on a bench, so you do need to build up um, the area yeah. underneath the fan to support support it in that frame. Is but it, it is it's possible to. Is is that. there anywhere um, one could get advice f as to how that should be carried out properly? Um, again, uh, visit our um, the AICCM website, mm -hmm. and there'll and be local. And it's just AICCM.org.au. Yeah. Oh, A A R A I. AI. Yes, AICCM.org.au. Yes. Okay. And there's actually a, a link that says 
find a conservator or conservator That's or right. something oh, like good. that. So, Great. And then they have a list of conservators in every city. Yeah. Thank you very or, much. I mean, the yellow pages um, as well, some conservators advertise on that in there as well. There are some framers that can help there and normally they will be advertised on the website or in the yellow pages. Um, I wanted to ask a question about photographs again. Um, our 1960s wedding photographs are in a 1960s folio which, or, um, with a plastic sheet over the top. Um, the, often, um, are we talking about, they call them so-called magnetic photos where you have the sticky strips no, and then I the plastic over the top? No, I think they were probably stuck in and then there was some sort of, yes, there was some sort of adhesive and then the plastic sheet went over the top. Yeah, so, so mm. they're often referred so to as, as magnetic albums and they use the same sorts of adhesives that you see in sticky tapes, so they're, they're, they're not good for your photos. Mm -hmm. um, those adhesives um, go through different phases as they deteriorate, so they'll become very sticky, they'll migrate into the paper fibres of the mm. photographs and then they, they start to change colour, so they go yellow, then they go dark orange and turn very hard. Now, when you've got photos that, that are not easy, that are already in those albums, it's best not to try to remove them your, yourselves because they do get stuck quite firmly and trying to remove them, you, you will likely cause further damage. So it is good to take those to a, to a conservator to, to have them remove them for you. Um, and, but again, you know, you can take, take a digital photo of, of your no photo way. and then make up a new album um, and, and at least sort of record them as they are now before they deteriorate further. Yeah. Okay, so we've just got time for one more question. Um, Karen, I wonder if you had any particular advice about photographic slides. We've got a, a large collection of, of um, slides from the 1950s and possibly early 60s. They're medium format slides and a lot of them are glass encased mm. and they're starting to fall apart. They're, they're, they're coming detached from the paper They've got a lot of dust on them. We want to know what we should be doing for storage and restoration if possible. Well, often with slides, it's good to store them vertically. Um, a lot of your conservation suppliers will sell enclosures for keeping slides in. Um, so, so it's good to sort of, and the different formats for the different size slides and things like that. So it's good to, good to get those for them. Um, again, you don't want, I mean, because if you, you know, you don't want the weight sort of compiling when you're storing them. Um, horizontally if you're storing them in stacks. Um, but you, you, um, you can interleaving again is, is a good thing to do. But when you start to see damage already, um, take them to a conservator to, to have them give you some advice on, on fixing them and, mm -hmm. and dealing with those I issues of damage. And with dust, is there anything better we can do other than hit them with a, a, a dust blower? No, that's that. I mean, that's that's a good way to, to sort of deal with with dust. But if you've got them in enclosures um, where the dust can't get to them anymore, that that would be the best way to deal with dust. Okay. Well, I'd like to I'd like to. Um, Thank everyone again. So thank you, Kayama, for being part of today. And um, thank you, everyone, who's come to, to see the session. 